the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, this is the Entree Leadership Podcast, where I take calls from leaders like you about what it takes to win in any stage of your business and your leadership. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, with over 30 years of experience leading in the trenches right alongside you. I started this deal on a card table in my living room, and I've stumbled forward for 30 years. And here we sit. So I have a PhD in DUMB. I know what it's like to do stupid butt stuff and survive, and I'm here to help you do just that. If you're looking for a uh, think tank theory from a business think tank, from a pointed head professor who's never made payroll, you're in the wrong place. I make payroll every freaking week uh, and have for 30 years. We got 1,100 people on this team, and we're here to help you. If you got a question about business, that's what this is about. It's called entree leadership. You got a question about leadership, for that matter. It doesn't even have to be business, it can be ministry. We'll talk about it. If you got a question, just call us. The phone number is 844 944 1070. 844 944 1070. Or you can leave us a little message at the website. We'll get back to you, set you up as a caller, and do all that stuff since this is, after all, a podcast. EntreeLeadership.com slash ask. EntreeLeadership.com slash ask. Josiah starts us off in Missoula, Montana. What's up, Josiah? Hey, doing real well. Saved and born again, heaven bound. I love it. Life's good you? in your family. Yeah. Cool. How can I help? Yeah, I am a uh, owner operator of a small uh, hot tub business, do uh, repairs and water maintenance. Um, and looking to see what is kind of some key uh, clues, if you will, of when I should be hiring my first employee uh, financially, time-wise, that kind of thing. And then how was the best way to go about doing that to get somebody in that seat that can serve the company well? Wow. That is the first employee you hire, the first team member you hire, is by far exponentially the hardest team member you will ever hire. It's hard because emotionally you're accepting the responsibility for this person and their family. You are trusting your brand, your reputation with your customers, your relationships to someone else for the first time. It's like your teenager got their license and leave home in the family car. It scares the crap out of you. And uh, it's very hard. It's also hard financially to figure out when to do it and how to do it with the math, which is also what you're asking about. And so um, I I don't want to understate that this is hard. This is a difficult thing you're asking. It sounds very simple. It sounds very primitive in business. But uh, I got to tell you, it's hiring. I've got 1,100 people hiring the 1,100th. I didn't even notice. The first one, I, I I couldn't sleep. I mean, it was like, I was so worried. Uh, So here's the deal. Number one, we're going to look at this as a leader pulls, a boss pushes. And your job as a leader is to serve. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to get my head around my job. If I bring someone on is I have to be able to keep my word. I have to pay them what I said I would pay them. And I have to have set my business up in such a way that it will do that. I, my integrity is on the line to that employee, to that team member. I have to be able to do that. That's the first thing I'm going to get out of the way. Now, and so that means that you have to have enough hot tubs to uh, to keep clean, enough people on your route, so to speak, enough people subscribed to right. your service that you can't get the work done. Because as long as you can get the work done, you can't financially justify someone else. Okay. Uh, it, you know, so so because right now you're a solopreneur, we call it. You're out there. You right. are the business. You're the CEO, the chief everything officer. So what I need is I need to be so busy with actually maybe even some clients in queue, in line on the waiting list that I can't get to. And then maybe I raise my prices and do it again uh, and and just really, you know, I really want this thing super profitable, super busy, super prosperous to where when someone steps in to pick it up, it's, there's, it's a no brainer that there's plenty of work for them to do. Thus, I'm going to have plenty of money to pay them. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. You don't hire yeah. someone hoping they're going to do enough work to justify themselves. You need to have so much work stacked up that they walk into this like a hot knife through butter. And okay. uh, too many times in business, we think of, oh, if we hire someone, the business will come. No, dude, you got to go get the business and then you hire someone. And, and so that will take a lot of the stress out of it. And then that re- that leaves you only with the last piece of stress, which is training them to do it the Josiah way, not the guy's way that you hired. And so right. this is how we do it at my company. I know they may have done it another way at another company, or I know you may have never done this before, but this is how we treat customers. This is how we, when we're going to someone's home, how we act. Here's how we address the lady of the house. Here's how we address the gentleman of the house. Here's how we bill. We put on uh, the little paper booties if we're walking through their home. Whatever the thing is that you do that makes people very glad they have Josiah doing this, we show up on time. We do what we're supposed to do. Then when we leave, the uh, the equipment is running perfectly. Uh, we never charge people for repairs that weren't done. You know, we have integrity. You just have, and you have to talk through things that to you are obvious, but to someone else is training them the Josiah way. And then you can begin to turn over your reputation, your brand to someone else's work. And then you got to check on them and you got to call the customer and go, Hey, you know, Henry was over there today. How did Henry do? Uh, Is everything okay? I just want to follow up. I'm new at this. It's my first team member. I'm a little nervous. I want to make sure you're being taken care of, Mr. and Ms. Smith. And you follow up on the customer service side and and make really, really sure they are doing a great job and push them all the way through that way. But um, I think it's good to say out loud again, for your sake and for everyone out there, this thing about hiring their first team member, mathematically, financially, emotionally, uh, brand, all of these make the first team member you hire the most difficult exponentially. It scares the crap out of you. And if it doesn't, you're not wise because what you, you're, what you're saying, if you're a little bit scared about it is you're saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to, I'm going to step into the unknown. I'm going to go learn how to do this. But until I've actually hired someone, successfully trained them, made them a part of this, and made payroll and paid them properly, I haven't proven to myself or them that this can be done. And I'll give you an example of this, Josiah, that for the first 50 people or so we hired, and really even past that, people would ask the question sometimes in the interview, because I was the brand in those days. I was the only thing creating revenue, Dave Ramsey the Dave Ramsey show, the Dave Ramsey books, the Dave Ramsey speaking, all of those kinds of things was creating all the revenue back then. And people would ask, well, what happens if Dave dies? And our answer was truthful. You're screwed. This place is going to fold up like yesterday's Walmart tent if Dave dies, because I'm the source of all the revenue. So I just, you got to be honest with them, you know, and people would say stuff like, you know, we had 10 team members. What are your benefits? Uh, your check clears. That's your benefits. We don't have benefits. What do you mean benefits? Benefits are you got a job. That's your benefit. Benefits are you actually work with somebody that knows your name. Benefits are you're working with family that cares about you. Uh, but if you want corporate benefits, you need to go get screwed by corporate America because we're small business people. We don't have big benefits. That was in the old days. Now, today, I got a pretty good benefits package if you work here. Okay, we've got like 401ks and matching and PTO and all this other crap around here. You know, all these things that people pile up. We get them all kinds of insurance. We got all kinds of stuff for people. But in the old days, it was like, what are the benefits? And what happens if Dave dies? And you just got to be honest, in other words. And so, Josiah, you're hiring your first guy, and he goes, hey, uh, tell me about your leadership style. And you're going, uh, clueless, because I've never done it before. Uh, but we're going to figure it out together, and I, I'm, I, I'm always going to tell you the truth, and I'm going to love you, and I'm going to take care of you as best that we have money coming in, and uh, just be honest. Be authentic, and that's so freaking refreshing instead of somebody posturing and strutting around like they know what they're doing when everybody in the room but them knows that they don't know, and so go ahead and just say what it is. Say it out loud. And uh, when our kids were teenagers years ago, they had this thing. They would do their hands with the 
can't even remember how they did it. Their hands with their, uh, with their, uh, how, how you do it? Thank you. I can't, I, I can't even do it. Uh, that's it. No, I'm still, he's backwards. Okay. You, where your thumbs come out, you anyway, it's awkward turtle, right? They would say awkward turtle, like a turtle is over on its back. So what is this? Awkward turtle is me trying to do this thing and I can't do it right now. But, um, yeah, so, oh, there it is. I got it. Woo! Okay. All right. Thanks. I got all kinds of guys in the booth showing me how to do this crap. And I'm four years old and can't do it. But awkward turtle is we're going to have an awkward conversation. So let's just say it out loud. We're, it, it's awkward. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'm insecure about hiring someone new because I've never hired anyone. You may be better at interviewing than I am at interviewing because you may have been hired more than one place. I've never, you're my first team member. If I hire you, it's okay to say all that. If that runs them off, then they didn't need to be coming in. Cause they thought they had a, cause that's who you are. You're a one man band and you're getting ready to turn over some of the instruments to the other guy. And you're going to play the rest of the instruments in the band, but wow. And I did that. I told people, I said, you know, number one, this place is going to fold up like Walmart tent. Number two, if I die, number two, I don't know what I'm doing, but I do know what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm helping people. In your case, Josiah, we are one of the best companies that cares the most about its customers, the quality of the water in their hot tub, make sure it's proper, the chemicals are properly balanced, the cleaning is properly done, any repairs are properly done. Our customers don't have to worry. We know how to do that. We're really good at that. And what we need to do is more of that. And can you help us? Do you want to come on board? And if you do, you're going to participate in the growth of this company. We're always going to be generous to you. We're always going to be kind to you. And we're always going to tell you the truth. Nobody's going to yell at you or cuss at you here. And this is what we're doing. So come on, let's go get some work done. And that's how we did it. Just being very, very, very authentic in the process. That's the thing. So that's how it works. Your first hire is your hardest. Your second is your next hardest. Your third is your next hi hardest. And uh, really, until you get up above 50 or 60 people and you start hiring some uh, C-suite level executives, it doesn't really get hard again. And uh, it gets easier and easier and easier. Oh, and by the way, first time you fire someone, that's the hardest. First time someone that you really counted on, that you really love, quit, and it hurts your feelings, that one's the hardest. The 1,000th that quits? Oh, well. This is the Entree Leadership Podcast. Hey, Entree Leadership listeners. Dave Ramsey again. Of course, we are excited to have the one and only Lewis Howes in the studio with us. Brand new book, The Greatness Mindset. Unlock the power of of your mind and live your best life today. Now, Lewis is a New York Times bestselling author of the book, The School of Greatness. The Greatness, uh, greatness is the title of your podcast yeah. as well. You spend a lot of time working on greatness. And you know what? This is a topic that I am just kind of, I'm, I'm a little bit pissed off about, <laughs> Why? honestly. Uh, not about greatness, but about the fact that I, I'm talking to a lot of my friends right now, and I've heard you've been on some of their shows too, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a whole group of us that are kind of raising up against this mediocrity movement, mm. the quiet quitting movement, mm. the uh, I, I, YOLO movement, mm. the uh, movement of I want to work as little as possible and have and expect people to give me stuff for free. You know that movement, right? It's called communism, I think. But <laughs> yeah, but the, the the greatness mindset, striving for greatness, striving mm. for excellence, it always unlocks things. It always unlocks yes. gifts for you and talents for you. And, and you've really studied greatness for mm. like a decade plus. Decade, yeah. So what? Do you, let's just get start with the idea: what is greatness, and why bother? Well, I think I want to share what greatness is by first defining what success is to me from my own personal experience and what I've studied. I wanted success most of my life. I wanted it in sports and then in business. And I got it for me, but I realized it wasn't everything. And at 30, I was like, well, I'm accomplishing so much in sports. I'm winning. I'm getting the awards. Uh, you know, I'm making money in my business, but why do I still not feel fully fulfilled? And that's when I started to study greatness. And I realized that greatness is really what you've been doing for so long. It's about using your gifts and talents to pursue your dreams, but making the impact on the people around you. Whereas success is more about how can I win? How can I look good? How can I accomplish for me 
Whereas greatness is about how can I do those things in the service of others? And that's where I really love and try to model the things that you've done, which is about growth and contribution in your process of goals. Well, the idea, I mean, we're talking to small business people on the Entree Leadership Podcast, and the idea being here that business can have soul. Yes. Or it can have success. Mm. But if, if it's going to have greatness, it's got soul. 100%. To it. It's got, it's, there's some, it's visceral. You can feel the service. You can feel the community is glad you're there. Yes. Your customers are glad you're there. They don't feel screwed over in every transaction. Yeah. They feel uh, celebrated and seen. Like your, you know, your customers, when they get out of debt, they come here and they scream and they celebrate and they go through an emotional experience because of the service you provide. As I said, with the, uh, the the crap on TikTok and the crap on Twitter particularly, I mean, some of the other platforms are, are, are not as bad, but they are still got their version of it. There, there's this whole thing of, and there always has been, it's just social media is a new way to do it. it. Amplifies it, it yeah. yeah. It amplifies the stupidity. But the um, but there's always been, there seems to be a, a, a disturbing level of people that are somehow demotivated to reach for the stars. Yeah. And it's just distressing. I, I feel like the old guy, get off my lawn. You know, I mean, come mm -hmm. on, man. Success. I mean, it, it's greatness. Go do it. And, and, and you talk about your path to success means you must tune out the critics. A hundred percent of the time, the people that are, if you're going for it, if you're leaving it all on the field, if you're getting up, leave the cave, kill something and drag it home, the people that are part of that anti-work movement, I'll call it, uh, are going to be critical. Yes. How do you tune out the critics? I think for me, I've found good coaches that give me great feedback. That's the right information that I need to improve and to grow and overcome. But as you know, no one um, great is really critical of others. No one who is an author leaves nasty reviews on other authors' books. No one who's actually doing the work and creating things are out there talking bad about others. Maybe it's a few people, but most people, when they're creating something and doing something, they know how hard it is to do that work and they're not critical of others. So it's being aware and to really keeping your, your coaches, your mentors, your team close to you to give you the right feedback to support you to overcoming these challenges, but not listening to the critics and only relying on their opinions in order to see if you are of value in doing good work. Better a weary warrior mm. than a quivering critic. Yes. You know, never been a statue erected to the critics yeah. man in the arena yeah the the classic lines mm -hmm. uh from roosevelt yep. you know and and i'd rather have that that dust on me i'd rather have those bruises on dirt me the scars blood. on me i'd rather have the 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 dirt under my fingernails the the mental calluses uh from the stress of having tried than to be the quivering yeah. soul in the corner that Roosevelt talks about that never tried. And I don't think you can have greatness with instant gratification. Again, this is something I think you preach a lot where it's like you can't be great if you just want something that you didn't earn or deserve or put work into creating and developing. If you didn't overcome something, you can yeah. be great as a human being for your generosity, but the instant gratification desire that you're talking about on mm -hmm. social media where it's like, I want this now without doing the work, without putting the reps. I don't think you can be great in that endeavor without doing those things. Well, talk about the role of, and, and you do a great job. Uh, talk about uh, the role of failure mm. on the path to Man. greatness. I don't know. Did you play sports growing up? Yeah. What was your main sport? Uh, hockey. Ice hockey. hockey. Yeah. When I played sports, um, water skiing, but yeah, water skiing, um, a lot of falls, <laughs> yeah, a lot, lot of failure. No, here, here's a funny, you know, speaking about the internet and uh, and memes. Here's a meme that I actually appreciate. There's a meme that I've seen out there uh, years ago that is of a baby trying to walk, and the quote above this photo of this baby trying to walk says, "When a child is learning to walk and it falls almost a thousand times, never does he think to himself, maybe this walking thing isn't for me.'" It's actually the path to falling and stumbling and be like, okay, I got to figure out how to stabilize myself that it takes us to require to walk and learning that process. In sports, failure was just feedback. It was the information that I needed. Okay, this approach to my shot doesn't work. That's information. It's feedback. Let's adjust it and try it the next time. In sports, you know, Michael Jordan missed half of his shots and he was the greatest of all time, arguably. The best baseball players fail 70% of the time. They strike out 
or don't hit a, a, a hit 70% of the time, and they're the greatest. And they have a 300. I mean, and they have oh 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just think it's it's approaching failure as part of the process towards success and accomplishing what you want. I love this um, story from Sarah Blakely. I'm not sure if you've met Sarah. Yeah, I know Sarah. Sarah yeah. from Spanx sold her company, I think, for $1.2 billion a couple of years ago. Sarah and Jesse have spoken for us at Yeah, they? they're yeah. amazing. And um, she has this amazing story that I talk about in the book where she said every night at the dinner table, when she was growing up, her dad would ask a simple question to the kids. What did you fail at today? And they would get in trouble if they didn't fail at something, if they didn't have something to say that they tried at. And I think celebrating the effort and saying, you did it, keep going. Okay, you're going to stumble and then it's going, you're going to figure it out eventually. And if not, if not, maybe that's not your thing and try the next thing. But celebrating the failure as a part of you're trying, you're learning, you're massaging, you're creating your talent, your gift. It's all part of the process. Don't shy away from it. Lean into it. And yeah, for those of you who don't know, Sarah Blakely started the Spanx the underwear to make you look skinny thing, mm -hmm. and one of the first, uh, one of the youngest female billionaires in American history. Brilliant, brilliant business and lady. she talked about failure is the way. Yeah, it is the way. It's the path. I'm convinced having, after having met uh, people in ministries, uh, huge ministries, and sports figures, uh, country music people mm -hmm. that I know here in Nashville, uh, business people that have done amazingly things, say, things of scale, that failure is really a pile of garbage all the things you did, you just happen to be standing on it instead of laying under it. I like that. You know, it's just this this gleaming mountain of success like really probably has a stench to it. You know, <laughs> the smell of I mean, it. It's just yeah. really, it's really ugly. You got to climb really, it all. I don't to get really want to look down from there, but I, because I know what I'm standing on is right. all of my stupid stuff yeah. that I survived and never do again. See, I do a lot of stupid stuff, but my motto is don't do the same stupid stuff twice. Yeah. It's course correction. I wish I... It's course did, correction. It takes me a while to learn things, and I do a lot of the stupid yeah. things over and over. Winners <laughs> never quit. Yeah, they do. They quit doing the stupid stuff. Right. You know? But you don't quit, quit. You just quit doing that thing that way because it didn't work. You adjust it. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, it's a, it left a mark. Ouch. Yeah. I don't want to do that again. Ouch. Yeah, exactly. And uh, man, I you know I did that listening to the tapes of my radio show when I first mm. started. It sounded like the Beverly Hillbillies were doing talk radio. It's country <laughs> fried from now on. You mean you weren't perfect and, right away? Oh. Oh, you, you have no idea how bad it was. It was so bad. and uh, But I listened to it, and I went, God, you have absolutely no credibility. You sound like you are you, you like your parents are cousins. Mm. This is awful. And so I had to go course correct. I yeah. had to get a little help with my – I didn't want to take all the southern uh, twang out because some of it has a certain appeal. But yeah. but uh, I had to get enough out to where I had some credibility. Sure. Oh, my gosh. Sure. Because it really was bad. And that's why I think having a coach, you know, from – interviewing a lot of top athletes and being an athlete myself, I never accomplished my goals without a coach, yeah. without having some support. If you can't hire a coach, finding a personal advisory board of mentors and friends and peers that can support you. And I just think there's this kind of lone wolf mentality as well out there. It's like, I'm going to do it all on my own. And again, being here, knowing you have a thousand employees and you're impacting tens of millions of people every day through your network, you can't do that on your own. You need a team, you need coaches, you need advisors, you need support to get you to that next level. And I just think that's wisdom. Yeah, that's one of the, the, the entree leadership materials. We have entree leadership coaches here on, on the team that work with the small business owners that are listening to us right now. And uh, you just, you cannot, without videotape, and someone to help you analyze the videotape, you can't correct that's your it. golf swing. That's it. You just can't do it. You can't, and you got to have someone else looking over your shoulder and going, you don't really see that, do you? Give me that and, feedback, um, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm blessed here because I've got so many high-quality leaders in my inner circle that we're all accountable to each other, mm -hmm. and so they we coach each other internally. Exactly. But um, one of the biggest things that small business people struggle with is exactly what you said, is loneliness. Because you know you can't see your own flaws. You can't. You know you can't see that swing is not, yeah. you know, you're off swing plane. You're going to hook the ball. You know that's going to, and, and you got to see the video, and then you got to have a guy go, oh, look, if you'll just change that stance mm -hmm. that much. Oh, look at that. Look at the, what that did. Isn't that amazing? I don't do anything without a coach or at least an advisor or a mentor or someone who's been there and done that and leaning on them consistently. And that's why I think, you know, again, if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner, like if you haven't signed up for uh, your coaching program here, that should be the first step people take because I don't do anything without a coach if I want to be great at it. One of the things I loved about the new book, The Greatness Mindset, unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today. Lewis Howes is my guest, is this really the, the 
thesis, the central concept of the book is the greatness mindset. Yes. So explain what you mean when you say a mindset of greatness. There's a, there's a page in here that is an assessment that I talk about the difference between the powerless mindset and the greatness mindset. And this powerless. is powerless, powerless mindset and versus okay. the greatness mindset on page 201. And it's okay. just a simple graphic that allows you to see it and reflect and say, where am I stepping into a powerless mindset? This does not mean you're bad or wrong or judgment. Just where are you at? Do I lack a meaningful mission? If so, I'm not stepping into my greatness when I'm not clear on a path. It doesn't mean I have to know that I'm going to, what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Just what season am I in? And am I taking action on that path? Does fear control me? If so, it has some type of power over me. It's holding me back. It's causing me to not act courageously because I'm controlled by fear. Am I crippled by self-doubt? I'm a big believer that self-doubt is the killer of dreams. We could have all the talent in the world. We could have everyone else around us saying, you're incredible, you can do it. But if we don't believe, we're not going to take the yeah, action. We were talking about the haters, but the yep. worst haters sometimes in our own head. Man, I don't know about you, Dave, but if if um, they recorded my thoughts when I was younger growing up, my teen years, my 20s, and they put it on a loudspeaker to the world, they'd probably put me in a mental institution for all the negative things I said to me. What? And if I said these things to my friends and my family, my partner— they wouldn't want to hang out with me. Yeah, we, we don't allow people to bully people anymore, but we bully ourselves. So much. And so, again, it is, uh, we're, we're, we're concealing our past pains, and that's why we hurt, we hurt ourselves. We say nasty things to ourselves. We're defined by opinions of others. That means we're more powerless when we act out of fear of what other people think about us, and we drift towards complacency. Again, what you were talking about, this kind of quiet quitting mentality, this I don't want to work hard, the complacency is a powerless mindset way of thinking. So it's just being aware of these things. And again, it's not right or wrong, good or bad, but stepping into greatness means de- being driven by a meaningful mission, addressing and writing down your fears. I call it the fear list, going all in on your fears and making them something you're confident in, something you overcome, overcoming the self-doubt, whatever that insecurity where you say, I'm not enough and learning how to make it and I am enough and I'm still improving and growing, that's what we need to do. We heal the past. We create a healthy identity, which means we're not speaking horribly to ourselves constantly. We create a new contract with ourselves that we step into consistently, and we take action with a game plan. Again, your seven baby steps is a game plan. It's taking action with a game plan based on a meaningful mission. And a meaningful mission with a greatness mindset is not just for me, me, me. It's for we. It's how can I impact the people around me in my world. Yeah, it's work that matters. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be. Do, I got to be doing something that matters exactly. at the end of the day. When we add it up, was it worth? Did it do something for the culture? Did it do something for the society? Did it do something for the organization? You know, this does align exactly with what we were talking about with failing forward, as our yeah. friend John Maxwell would say. This idea that the gleaming mountain of success is really a pile of garbage. It involves um, engaging in activity, which one hundred percent of the time is going to cause you to make mistakes. 100%. The only way to avoid a mistake is do nothing, right? But doing nothing is a mistake. Yeah. And then you get, <laughs> then you made a different kind of mistake, the, yeah. the mistake of passivity. Yes. And, and so you engage in activity 100% of the time, you're going to make a mistake mm-hmm. of some kind to some degree. Uh, and then you get to create a healthy identity, yes. which is forgive yourself 100%. for having done something stupid. 100%. I mean... I, the stupid stuff I've done became my brand, and it's it's working for me. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, it's my failures are like make me relatable. But you, you don't know? beat yourself up over them all the no, time. No, I don't. You've, I mean, the rearview mirror is smaller than the windshield yeah. for a reason. You've owned it. You've accepted it. You've taken responsibility. You've had peace with it. And I'm not in denial right. that I did something stupid. I'm not in denial it, it yeah. caused me pain or someone else pain yeah. or both. Uh, I'm not in denial, but it is in the rearview mirror, and there is nothing I can do about it. So I'm going to look out the windshield. It's a lot larger, and let's go on to the next thing. Yeah. Next up. But next a, up. But a, but a lot of times, at least I did this, and I know other people, we hold on to the memories of our past so much in our present, and it affects our future as well because we're living in that past. Well, and we, we'll cover that same conversation 4,000 times in our head that's already gone. Gone. The person's dead. Can't do anything They're about not it. even alive anymore. Gone. And you're still having the conversation. Move on. Yeah. That's grace. That's personal grace, Mm -hmm. giving yourself forgiveness for not being perfect and existing in a human body. And and oddly enough, 
not being perfect, existing in a human body and uh, in a human experience and forgiving yourself for those things is an, an element of greatness. 100%. That's weird. Again, it's healing past pains is the greatest not mindset. It's not yep. concealing past pains and being in shame. Or being in denial about them. Denial, lack of forgiveness, uh, resentment. That doesn't support your peace. I know exactly what I did when I was 26. That caused me to file bankruptcy when I was 28. Mm. I know exactly what I did. And, and I know who did things to me. Yes. I was a victim of some things. Yes. But I was also set myself up to be a victim. So ultimately, yeah. I was not a victim at the right. end of that. So I'm going to take personal responsibility for the mm -hmm. parts that I have. I'm going to avoid the type of people that 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 can do that to you. And that's one of the things called banks. You know, I'm, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm going to do these kinds of things. I'm going to make these decisions to never be there again, mm -hmm. to never be there again, to never be there again. So, uh, yeah, there's a scar there, and I, there's a memory there with that goes with that, but you, it's not my identity. It's it's in the past. Yeah. And man, in business, guys, you guys listening, you people doing leadership, you're gonna screw up. You're managing people. Oh, you're man. gonna make mistakes. You're gonna you're gonna trust the wrong people. Uh, you're gonna place loyalty in the wrong places. You're gonna fight sometimes on a hill mm. you shouldn't be fighting on. <laughs> uh, welcome to running a business. Welcome to human interactions. Yeah. Uh, so forgive yourself and move on. Don't do the same thing again. Right. I mean, that's it. That that one I'm not going to do again. That one I'm not going to do again. And this is the great part of the greatness mindset. And for goodness sakes, have a meaningful mission. And for goodness sakes, have a good coach in your corner. Get in yes. touch with his entree leadership. If we can help you with that, we'd love to. Yeah. Lewis Howes, you're a great man. You are greatness. Uh, you are... Uh, I've been watching your career. We've been friends a long time. Yeah. You have blown up. You've become a huge deal. I'm so proud of you. Thank you, sir. The Greatness Mindset, his latest best-selling book, Unlock the Power of Your Mind and Live Your Best Life Today. So be sure and check it out. He's a New York Times best-selling author. Check out his podcast as well. He's been a friend of ours for a long time and will continue to be. Thanks for stopping Thanks, by, brother. Sir. Appreciate it, bro. Good to Thank have you. you. Thanks, Dave. Welcome to the Entree Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Ramsey. Well, this is it, you guys. Entree Leadership Summit, arguably one of the best, if not the best, leadership event in North America today. I'm proud of it. It's an event I would go to even if I didn't own it. I would be sitting in the audience and taking notes, and I will be sitting in the audience and taking notes. It's almost completely sold out. If you're going to go, it's time to pain or get off the ladder. It's time to make a decision. If you want to be there, you need to get your tickets. They're almost gone. The premier leadership conference of the year. Well, you're here from the world's top business and thought leaders. Jordan Peterson will be there. My friend Willie Robertson from Duck Commander will be there. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell will be there. Dr. John Deloney, Ken Coleman, Dave Ramsey will be there. Many other top line speakers, teachers walking you through this leadership journey. If you want to come to Nashville, we're going to be doing this in our home city. We would love to have you for the Entree Leadership Summit. Go to entreeleadership.com slash summit and reserve your spot before they're sold out. It's coming up this May, and you don't want to miss it, boys and girls. All right, Sean is next up. Sean is in St. Louis. Hey, Sean, how are you? I'm great, Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve, brother. What's up? I uh, appreciate you taking the call. Uh, I got a dilemma here. I have, uh, own a lawnmower dealership with uh, 18 members, been in business about seven years. My landlords have more than doubled the rent in the past six years. Um, I don't really want to buy the building I'm in, and it would take probably 800000 plus to build something or buy something. Uh, curious your advice on what to do, I guess, and how much to save before I go for something like that. Okay. Uh, one more time. You're in the lawn, what business? Uh, lawnmower dealership. So I sell uh, zero turns and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so how important is the traffic count in front of the location or does the location matter at all? Is it destination customers? No, the traffic is very important. The location we're at is very good. Uh, so I don't want to lose that. Yeah. Well, you've lost it because you can't pay the rent. It doesn't make sense anymore. So we're going to go somewhere else. But, but traffic count matters. So it does ma the 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 quality of the uh, the traffic count by there. The number of cars per day in front of it is a big advertisement for you, and it lets people know to come there to buy the lawnmower, right, or or to get it repaired yes. or whatever. Okay, that makes sense. So, what's your uh, gross revenues? 
Uh, we do about a million and a half right now and hopefully growing year over year. But okay. That's where we're at right now. And you got a high cost of goods sold because you're running an actual hard inventory piece, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. It's so probably, what are your, uh, mar- your margins under 10%? Uh, it's more like 20, probably. Gro- that's a gross margin, though. You're not netting that, are you? Uh, no, and that's, yeah, and that's probably closer to 10. You're yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was thinking. All right. Cause I mean, you got a big, you got a big dog piece of machinery in the, in the equation here. Okay. So, yes. <sighs> all right. Number one, uh, I would not think about buying today. I would just move to another rental location. Okay. And, uh, we want to tie it up, uh, at least five years. I prefer to tie it up five years with an option to buy it if it meets certain guidelines. Now, here's the problem. How much? How long have you been in business? Uh, seven years. Good for you. How much have you grown during that seven years? A lot. Uh, I think the first year we were probably 250000 What about in so. terms of space needs? How much have you grown? We're definitely busting at the seams now. So you've grown, um, four, you've grown 4X in space needs as well as revenues? Yeah. I think, I, I mean, I can get by where I'm at now. It's just... Uh, we're definitely bumping elbows. Okay. So, uh, you aren't you glad you don't own that? <laughs> yeah. You know, because you, all of a sudden the real estate starts squeezing your business creativity because you're subconsciously afraid to grow because you're outgrowing the place you bought and own. This is yeah. the problem with buying the real estate for a small business. Usually, if you're in a growth curve like you are, you're going to be better off for a long time being a renter, as long as you're growing, until you get cash flow so dramatically good that you can afford to buy way beyond your needs. And you've got, you know, you're buying 2x what your need is, so you can grow into it for years to come. All right. So what I want you to do is I want you to do two things. What, What your ideal property is today, if I'm in your shoes, is, uh, go to the, uh, the, an area of town that is the edge of the growth area. It's kind of green. Everything hasn't quite gotten there yet. It's not mature. You follow me? Yeah. So in the next 10 years, it's going to grow all up around you. You follow me? If yeah. you go to an area that's just okay right now, but was prime three years ago, 10 years from now, it's probably not an area people even want to drive into. Right. So go out to the edge of the green and and start talking to somebody about leasing there from them five years with a five-year option to renew with an option to purchase for X number of dollars anytime in those lease years. Okay. Okay. So, and it ought to be two X what you need in size. Pay some extra rent. Pay a little extra if that rent. building doesn't exist, do I ask someone to build it for me, I guess? Yep, and, yep. they build it and lease okay. it back to you. Got it. Um, uh, because it's not an expensive building. And you've got a pretty stable, ongoing concern. You would be a strong tenant for somebody to do that. You're not an A-class tenant, meaning you're not a credit tenant, but you, you've got a, a thing. And, and just keep poking around. And, and I want you to look at so much real estate in the next – several months that you're gagging on it. You hate real estate because you know, you know more about every building that's available in the area than anybody else, including all the real estate agents. Cause all you do is look at everything. Anytime you see an empty building, you look it up on the tax records, you call the owner and find out what's going on with it. Even if it's not for sale or lease, right? Okay. You're just, you're turning over rocks. You're turning over rocks. You're trying to find the right deal. This is exactly what I did, uh, 15 years ago, 14 years ago. All right. And I ended up with three properties that would work. Uh, the, only one of them would let me lease with an option. So I went with it. It was a 55,000 square foot building. I needed 13,000 feet. I, and I had an option to take the rest of the building as a tenant as I grew, as someone moved out. And I had an option to buy the building after five years for $5 million. I saved the $5 million during that five years, bought the building. It was worth $13 million. We outgrew it and came out to the green area I'm talking about seven years ago and bought 47 acres and started building again. 
And so I've experienced exactly what you're dealing with. And I'm telling you, if you're not careful, when I had that one fifty-five thousand square foot building and we had outgrown it, uh, it, you can't keep it because you love the real estate, you love the building, but you you all of a sudden the business is conforming to the real estate instead of the real estate conforming to the business. You follow me? That's what I don't yeah. want you to get into. I would rather you rent the rest of your business career than have the building tell your business what to do instead of your business tell the building what to do. I don't care if you own real estate for, for the purposes of the business. I care that the business grows and thrives first and foremost. And if, as a part of that, we can work some business building ownership into it, fine. If not, we'll take a bunch of those profits and just go buy some real estate for fun and still be a tenant. Does that make any sense? Yes, definitely. Because if you had, not, if you had called me 10 years ago or five years, seven years ago, and I told you some way to finance the building that you're in and you had bought it, you'd be screwed right now. Yeah. You'd be trying to figure out a way to move and sell the building you're in. You'd have a business problem and a real estate problem right now because you're, 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 you're all the way up against the wall. You've got no room for inventory. The customers can't walk through there. You've got stuff st stacked 10 high. There's no room for the parts delivery. I mean, I know what you're dealing because we did the exact same crap. We had, we had shipping stacked three high. We, 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 we threatened to put cubes in the building that were double-deckers. I mean, we were trying to figure out a way to make the stupid building work instead of make the business work around it. And that's what I want for you. I'd rather you just be a renter. Okay. But best Very case good. is you rent in enough space in an area that the that the, the economy is going to grow towards you, and you later can buy it when you've got the cash, no debt. You knew I was going to say that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some things are predictable, brother. Hey, man, that's a really good question. Thanks for letting me get on my soapbox and tell stories. But it also, they're real stories. They really happen, and uh, it really helps you in this situation but you do need a high traffic count location you are going to pay a premium rent for that in some way or another but maybe the particular location you're in is just more is a little bit more valuable than you actually need you don't need an a class location from a retail perspective you need a b minus or a c plus from a retail perspective to sell lawnmowers this is the entree leadership podcast Thanks for being with us on the Entree Leadership Podcast. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. This is common sense. In the South, we call it horse sense. I don't know why. Like horses have sense. But, um, yeah, it's just good old common country ideas that have been woven into sophisticated academic and leadership concepts and been used to create a $300 million business called Ramsey Solutions. I'm the owner. I started it on my card table in my living room over 30 years ago, and one layer at a time, one stupid butt thing at a time, I've survived. We've grown this thing, and uh, I've made every mistake out there, and I've made a lot of good decisions too, and that's how we got here. And we're here to help you do just exactly the same with your leadership skills, with your business, with your ministry, whatever it is. We would love to hear from you. If you want to be part of the podcast, you can call me at 844-944-1070. We'll help you. Or fill out the form at entreleadership.com slash ask, and we'll make you part of this. The other thing we need you to do is subscribe to this podcast if you haven't. Push the old follow button there, the subscribe button, whatever it is on YouTube or podcast or wherever it is you're consuming this. Thank you. Share it. Share the link to this. Tell people, hey, there's this wacky guy on the podcast helping people with real questions about business and share the link and leave us a five-star review. Mama said, if you haven't got anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Leave us a five-star review. All of those things help us promote this automatically within uh, all those algorithm thingies on the internet. And so we need your help with that. Every bit of it. Darren is with us. Darren's up next in Canada. Hi, how are you guys doing today? Better than we deserve, sir. How can we help? Okay, so I am a part of the school board for a small nonprofit grade school here. And my question today is how can I best lead with the spirit of humility for the rest of my school board members? Um, I'm the youngest member, brand new, and just 
I don't know, maybe a sense of peace for what I need here is all the alarm bells are going off and I don't know. It just seems like what, 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 alar- off, what alarm, bell? urgency. Wait a minute, what alarm bells? Mostly financial. So, um, I started this year was the year I started being part of the school board and no one seems to think that our school is going to shut down. But to me, it's looking like if we continue the way we're doing things, um, we're not going to make it very far. And I don't know, my, my thoughts keep getting pushed aside by the other board members, but I just don't see what they are supposedly seeing. Am I crazy or am I just young and inexperienced and just need to let them take care of it? Um, so, so it looks to you like that the revenue versus the expenses is on a crash course for the wall. Correct. That's a math thing. How are they, how are they explaining that away? I get a lot of, well, I can't reinvent the wheel, but I would think that, well, if you change terrain, you've got to change your wheels and we've changed terrain. No, 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 no. We have to first have agreement that we're heading towards the wall. Correct. Do we have agreement on that? Um, no. (laughs) Okay. Then uh, that, that let's start there. Um, and, and you know, um, if, if you say, okay, we, we've got, I'll make up a number, a hundred thousand dollars coming in and it appears we have $120,000 going out. How is it? You guys think we're covering that shortfall? I'm missing something. So the thing they keep saying, since we're a Christian school, mm-hmm. um, let God provide. Sure. I agree. Let God provide, but I believe he already has provided and we're just letting the money fall out the window. Um, but it, it, there is a shortfall and their answer is let God provide. Correct. We're just kind of sticking our head in the sand and okay. All right. that is not um, biblical. No, I agree. I, Jesus I said, don't, don't build a tower I... without first counting the cost, lest you get halfway up and you're unable to finish. And all who see you began to mock you and say, this man began to build and was unable to finish. Here's another bunch of Christians who can't seem to do math and they close the thing and hurt the reputation, the witness in the community, because they didn't bother to do arithmetic. Hey, God says he's going to feed the sparrows, but he doesn't drop worms into the nest. They have to leave the nest, go get the worms, right? Yeah. So um, if, uh, if the only answer to obvious systemic business problems, sowing and reaping cause and effect problems is la, 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 nothing's going on. God's going to provide. Uh, and you're not in power to stop that. Your best, your best bets not be there anymore. See, I don't, I think that we actually have a lot of potential though. I do think that we you don't have potential if you're going broke and everybody's standing around the airplane's out of gas. It's going to the ground, and everybody's singing "Kumbaya." Yeah, that's true. Um, I just think that I think the school has potential too, but it's got crummy leadership, is what you're telling me. Right, and I'm trying. That's kind of the point of the call. How can I best come to this? How many board members humility? are there? How many board members are there? Five total. And how did you get on this board? We are elected one by one from the society. Um, the yeah. society of what? Cool society. It's just all the parents. Okay, from from the from the customers. Correct. Okay, so it's a nonprofit, and the customers vote on the ki- the kids' parents vote on who's going to be on the school board. Correct. And you all five have equal votes. Correct. Is there an executive, a superintendent, a principal that's supposed to execute the directions of the board? Yes. This person is also thinks everything's okay? This person's part of the board. I know, but they also think everything's okay? They think that it will just, it sounds so weird to say it a lot, it will just work itself out in the end. Yeah. And I disagree. I'm, I want to be able, 
I do think that just with a few pen marks, you could fix this awfully quick. Um, just cutting, you know, cutting costs. St. Ambrose said, work like it all depends on you, pray like it all depends on God. Okay, so this this form of Christian narrative that in the, that if there's a form of Christian narrative that does not involve the power of God, it's not a Christian narrative. If there's a Christian narrative that does not involve you people taking responsibility for what he put in your hands as good managers and you're faithful in the little things, then it's also a toxic form of Christianity. And that's what you're discussing with me. So I don't know exactly how to convince someone not to do that, uh, but I'm probably pretty quickly going to draw a line in the sand. I personally don't want to be involved with this board if they're going to fly the airplane into the side of the mountain. I don't want to be on board. I'd rather I'd rather watch from a distance, you know, and uh, yeah. I, because if they, in other words, this is an ultimatum. If they refuse to be responsible stewards, God has entrusted the responsibility of this school to them, and if they refuse to take the practical, reasonable business actions to cause the school to exist, then these are not re- adults; these are children. And I'm going to put it on the table. I mean, you could you could do that humbly. You don't have to be as brash as I'm being right now. But that's the essence of what you're facing, Darren. And I'm so sorry. It's so frustrating. I've been in those kinds of meetings. Um, it's one of the reasons I, I don't serve on boards. I'm not very good at it because I'm right and they're wrong. And then there we are. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm the opposite of what you were asking about. You know, so I, I don't know if I'm good enough to answer your question. But how do I humbly approach this? I I, I think humble is you say. I'm not positive I've got any things, but my perception, ladies and gentlemen, is that God gave us this responsibility, and not addressing these issues is irresponsible, much like the parable of the talents. The one guy that was given the least amount did the worst with it, and what did Jesus do? He shut down the school. He took the money yeah. from the guy with the smallest amount in the parable of the talents that did a bad job and gave it to someone else, left him broke. Who'd he give it to? The one who addressed the issues, who did a good job of managing the money that he was given. So we have a responsibility as people of faith to take action and to do a good job as best we can with stewardship and then leave the results to God. In other words, if you're gonna you're gonna as you sow, so shall you reap. If you're gonna if you want corn, you should put some corn in the ground, not stand over the mud and pray for corn and say, Well, God'll take care of it, it'll work itself out. Yeah, you're gonna have sun and rain and mud and no corn because you planted sparingly and you're gonna reap sparingly. There's a cause and effect part of our faith walk as well. And so that's the kind of stuff I'm gonna talk to him about is we have a responsibility as stewards over this opportunity called this beautiful little school that we have. And if we don't manage that, and instead we just stand back and say, God's going to fix things that we were supposed to take care of, that is irresponsible stewardship, and that's covered in Scripture. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm afraid that. I don't know that they're going to hear that, though. I've tried. Yeah. So okay. So, so follow up then. From this point on, what can I do? In my mind, I would have um, a couple options. I could stick around and do my best to try to work it out till the end of the year, until that decision of closing or not comes up. Or would you just walk out and give up? Or would you take another option? I I, I don't know that there's I don't know that there's a nuclear option in terms of I, there's no, uh, I, 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 you know. I personally wouldn't stir up a church split over it. You know, I wouldn't try to get all the parents to fire all the board members and get responsible ones in there. No, I, no. I don't. I don't want to cause that much of a ruckus. I that that does feel uh, uh, it has a, it smacks of disunity and all those kinds of things that I abhor worse than I abhor poor stewardship. So, um, you know, I, I think if you got to do what you got to do, Darren. You got to make a decision. I have no idea what to tell you to do. I think if I'm in this situation, I'm going to really do everything I can to be as convincing and persuasive as I can 
that we have to address these things or we're going to lose this, and it's going to be our fault, and God trusted it to us. And then if they just look at you like you've got one eye in the center of your head and you're too dumb for words and, and they're not going to do any of it, I really can't leave my name on this disaster that's going to happen. I have to step out. Now, you can just choose to do that now uh, after having a discussion with them one last time, or you can choose to do that uh, at the end of the school year or whatever. But if you are convinced that their irresponsibility and their lack of uh, uh, diligence in managing this well, and in instead of taking making hard decisions, instead of adjusting expenses, instead of uh, not hiring because they can't afford to, and ignoring the mathematics, in, in case of any of that, then, then, then if you're convinced that they're just not going to do it, then you're not dealing with people that you want to be associated with long-term. I don't anyway. And, and so I've got to gently and kindly as I can go, guys, y'all have a different view on this than I do, and I don't fit in. And uh, I sure hope what you're doing works. I don't see how it's going to work. And I can't leave my name on something that I think is being mismanaged. Um, and it breaks my heart. I would love to. I would love to be in here and help, and I just can't. And so I've got to submit my resignation. Um, and uh, obviously, it's not a paid position anyway. Uh, it's just something you've got a heart for, and you're trying to be helpful to the community, and maybe your kids go there and whatever else. And it's just sad, just sad. But this happens a lot. This type of thing happens a lot in a nonprofit setting, um, sadly. And, uh, uh, but it, it is, it is incumbent upon those of us for the rest of you out there that are people of faith to trust God for his provision while simultaneously taking action and being responsible stewards over what he has given us. The area he has given you responsibility for, you're supposed to act on that area. That field is yours to till. That field is yours to plant. And if you don't do that and you stand back and say, God will provide, that is not Christianity. That's a form of mysticism that does not involve biblical Christianity uh, because God does not strike the field with lightning and corn pop up. He can, but he doesn't. Instead, he involves calluses on your hands, my hands, hoeing, getting the rocks out, putting the corn in the ground, and that's an act of responsible stewardship. And then once the corn's in the ground, then it's God's job to bring the sun and the rain. It's this wonderful dance, this rhythm, this partnership of faith with the great Almighty. And that's true in a nonprofit, and it's true for those of us that run a profit organization. By the way, there's no difference in nonprofit and profit, because as we've just heard from Darren, nonprofits that don't make a profit close. Nonprofit is an accounting entry by the tax people. It's not a biblical entry. It doesn't make it holy, and it doesn't give you a pass on cause and effect, sowing and reaping, because you put it under the heading of a nonprofit. And uh, so we have to address those things out there. Darren, I'm sorry. You've got a sweetheart. You're, you're kinder than me. I, I'm old enough. I'm the get-off-my-lawn guy. And so uh, I, I, you know, I, my patience for this kind of stuff has, has waned over the years. I'm not as, uh, you know, if I was sitting in the room with them, I might be a little gentler uh, than I am being right now. But that stuff aggravates the crud out of me, as you can tell. So I hope it works out for you. hope it works out for those little kids in that school. I hope you and I are wrong. And these people have a, they have a plan, they have a vision that we just don't see in this conversation, and it all works out. I, I'm not going to be mad if it all stays open. I, I don't want bad things for them. But uh, it, it does give us the ability to get on a soapbox and teach about a proper perspective of faith in the marketplace and how that all works out. Hey, if you've got a business or a leadership question that you want to ask me, Hey, just leave it. We might put it on the podcast. Go to entreleadership.com slash ask or give us a call and leave a voicemail at 844-944-1070. We're so glad you're with us. Spread the word for us, folks. I'll be on here yakking every Monday. We'll drop a new one of these. Don't miss out. It's called 
the Entree Leadership Podcast.